Hello, everyone. I'm just waiting a few seconds for everyone to um, be able to access everything and settle in. So I'll just give you a few more seconds. Okay, I think we've uh, got most people here now. So um, hello and welcome to this webinar delivered by the ISM Trust. The ISM Trust is the Incorporated Society of Musicians sister charity and works to ensure that all music professionals in the UK can reach their full potential. We create pioneering resources to support all those who work in music and seek to challenge, educate and inspire through webinars, seminars, events, printed and digital resources and advice packs. I am Maria Vzdiu and I'm Membership and Events Manager at the ISM and today I'm joined by Daniel Lewis for this webinar on PRS for Music and Introduction for Members. This is the second of our two-part series that will help you understand your rights as a music creator and today we will talk you through the benefits of becoming a PRS member. Before we begin, I just have a few technical points for you. If you experience any technical difficulties, such as sound quality issues, please let us know in the chat box and we'll make attempts to resolve the issue. If you wish to use them, subtitles are available by enabling them at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM Trust website at ismtrust.org forward slash webinars, as well as on, as on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please let us know in the Q&A box and we'll endeavour to answer as many of them as possible at the end. I will now hand over to Daniel for the presentation and I hope you enjoy. Thanks very much, Maria. Um, welcome back, everybody, uh, to this webinar series on PRS for Music. My name is Daniel Lewis and I am the Classical Relationship Manager here at PRS. Like I said in the last webinar, no worries at all if you don't write classical music. The content we'll cover today concerns all genres. Uh, last week, we discussed the background to earning royalties from your music, starting with copyright and licensing before looking at the role of the Collective Management Organization or Royalty Collection Society. We also looked at, at PRS for Music, the areas we license and some key concepts regarding our royalty distributions. And if you missed that webinar, please do check it out via the ISM Trust webinar archive. In this session, which is called PRS for Music, an introduction for members, we're going to start with a quick recap on PRS for Music. We'll delve into more detail regarding public performances and the tariffs that would apply when your music is performed in different venues, ranging from large concert venues to your local pub. The second half of the presentation will be much more practical and focuses on the various tools and areas of our website. Registering works is vitally important for any PRS for Music member, and I'll walk you through that entire process. And when your works have been registered, you can report live performances to us and we look at how to do that. Finally, we'll take a look at something called the Query Portal, which is a new way for members to contact and engage with the team here at PRS for Music. Just like in the last webinar, there'll be time for questions at the end. So please do stick around for that and ask me any questions at all about this presentation or PRS and royalties in general. So a quick recap on PRS for Music. PRS for Music is a royalty collection society, which consists of approximately 155,000 members. When members join PRS for Music, they assign their rights to us and we then administer them on their behalf. We do this by issuing licenses to our customers who include music venues, broadcasters, any business premises that performs music, streaming platforms, and many others. The fees that are generated by these licenses are paid out to our members in four main quarterly distributions, which are in April, July, October, and December. Our distributions have a threshold of £30, 
which means that you will need to generate at least £30 in royalties before payment is made to you. There is an exception for one distribution a year where the threshold is reduced to £1 and usually that's in October. PRS for Music, you remember, is a brand name used to describe two different royalty collection societies. These are the Performing Rights Society, or PRS, which licenses the performing right. And then there's the Mechanical Copyright Protection Society, which licenses the mechanical or reproduction right. The performing right is relevant whenever your music is communicated to the public for example, if performed live, broadcast, or streamed. The mechanical right is relevant whenever your music is copied, either physically as part of a product such as a CD, or digitally when it's broadcast or streamed. In order to receive royalties from PRS and MCPS, you need to become a member of each organization separately. And a lifetime membership to PRS costs £100, and it's the same for MCPS. That's a separate payment of £100. Today, we'll be focusing mainly on PRS for music and public performance. The licensing of public performance is undertaken by the joint venture PPL PRS Limited. The logo is on screen in the bottom right corner. This is formed of PRS, which administers rights on behalf of composers, songwriters, and music publishers. In other words, people who work with musical compositions. PPL, on the other hand, is concerned with sound recordings and administers rights on behalf of record labels and the musicians that play on the recordings. Prior to PPL PRS being founded in 2018, customers had to seek licenses from both organizations separately. PPL PRS therefore provides a single point of contact for the customer who is able to obtain the license much more easily. The main product of PPL PRS is called the music license. Organizations or premises that publicly perform music will need to take out such a license to ensure that composers and songwriters are remunerated for their work as per their legal right under the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, which I mentioned last week. The music license applies a variety of tariffs based on what music is performed and the context in which it is performed. Two contrasting examples might be a ticketed live concept and then recorded music, which is played as background music in a bar or an auditorium. A full list of tariffs is available on the PPL PRS website. So that's pplprs.co.uk. But I'll discuss some of the main tariffs related to public performance in this presentation. So PRS licenses concerts at a wide range of venues and we charge the promoter a fee per concert, which is based on different tariffs. Concerts of popular and classical music are charged as a percentage of gross admission receipts. The tariff applied for popular music is called tariff LP or live popular. This amounts to 4.2% of gross receipts in the case of concert venues and 2.7% if there's a qualifying music festival. Classical concerts are charged at 4.8% of gross receipts. Here, some promoters opt for a variable rate tariff, which operates on a sliding scale of up to 8% based on the amount of copyright repertoire featured in a program. Both tariffs are applied when the admission charge for a concert is above five pounds. For concerts where the admission charge is lower than five pounds, a minimum fee is charged based on admission and that begins at around 13, 14 pounds. So when vendors or promoters report their live music events to us, we send them an invoice and when payment is received, we distribute the royalties across all of the works reported 
in the set list or the program. All works in a concert are treated equally and the royalty is divided between them in proportion to the performed duration that is reported to us. If no duration is reported to us, we default to the duration provided by the songwriter or the composer when they registered the work with us. And I'll show you that later. So when the duration is missing from the work's registration, it will default to three minutes. So it's really, really important to provide us with a duration when registering a work, because that will mean you'll receive the correct amount of royalties. And again, we we'll look into this later on in the presentation where I'll show you how to register a work with PRS. A quick note on copyright or non-copyright or public domain repertoire. Royalties for each event are divided among the number of copyright works in the set list or program. Therefore, if your set list or program contains public domain repertoire, such as a folk song or a piece by a classical composer, such as Beethoven, those works will not receive royalties and you will therefore receive a greater proportion of the royalties relative to if those works were replaced with copyright repertoire. So this is particularly useful to note for classical composers whose work will often be performed alongside non-copyright repertoire. In terms of when you can expect royalties from these kinds of public performances, provided set lists and programs are returned to PRS in a timely manner, we aim to include payments covering pop and classical concerts by the second quarterly distribution after the event has taken place. If we take, for example, a concert held in January, the first distribution after then is April, so it would be paid in the next distribution, and that's in July. So that's concert venues. We'll next look at some other potential live performance venues, such as theatres or churches. When it comes to music in the theatre, it's important to note that PRS for Music does not license grand rights on behalf of its members. These are instead licensed by the rights holder directly, which in most cases would be the composer, songwriter, or music publisher if the composer is published. Grand rights refer to dramatic or musical presentations of musical works. So in other words, music that is used in conjunction with a dramatic narrative. The most common examples are opera, musical theater, and ballet. There are, however, certain contexts where PRS for music would license music in the theater. These typically form into three categories, overture and exit music, which is performed at the very beginning or end of a show, incidental music, which is music used for transitions and scene changes, and it's not typically audible to the characters in the show. And then there's something which we call interpolated music, which refers to music played during a show, which is audible to the characters. In these cases, music is not used in conjunction with the dramatic narrative, and therefore PRS for music licenses them. A variety of tariffs are applied depending on the capacity of the venue and the amount of music used. In the case of overture or exit music and incidental music, an annual flat rate is applied depending on the capacity of the venue. Interpolated music is charged as a percentage of gross box office receipts and operates on a sliding scale of one to 6%, depending on how much music occupies the total running time. PRS for Music also licenses cathedrals, minsters, and large churches that program concerts. Those that program more than six concerts a year are licensed as concert venues and will be charged according to the aforementioned live classical and live popular tariffs, so those on the previous slide. Churches that hold fewer than six concerts a year are typically licensed by one of our partners, CCLI, which stands for Christian Copyright Licensing International. Eligible venues can apply for a PRS for Music church license, 
which enables them to perform up to six concerts a year. The fee for this license is again dependent on the size of the audience or congregation. It's important to note that live music performed during divine worship or at weddings or funerals is exempt from a PRS license. Licenses are only required for concerts where members of the public pay an admission fee. Where performances do not fit into the categories described on the previous two slides, PRS for Music operates a general pur purpose tariff for smaller non-concert venues where there are not dedicated admission fees for live music concerts. These can include pubs, clubs, hotels, restaurants and bars, and venues where music is used, but it's not the primary focus of the business. The main difference with these types of venues is that they are not actually required to report performances to PRS. However, it's still possible for members to claim royalties for these types of music usages. PRS operates a gigs and club scheme where we pay a set royalty for each reported event. This is shared between all PRS writers whose work is performed. The royalty fee changes each year depending on the money collected from venues in the scheme. Currently, it's around £10. So let's assume that someone might be in a band and they perform a set at a local club. They can report that performance to PRS and in return receive payment from our gigs and clubs scheme. The set fee of approximately £10 would be divided among whichever members of the band contributed to the song. And that's decided between the band members before they register the work with PRS. Performances at pubs and clubs are reported via the live reporting tool on our website, which we'll look at shortly. If your music has been performed at any of these venues and you have not received payment, you're entitled to submit a claim to PRS. We can, investi we can investigate claims provided that the songwriter or composer was a member at the time of the performance. For concert venues and festivals, we were able to investigate claims for performances that took place in the past three years. For non-concert venues, such as pubs and clubs, we can investigate claims for performances that took place in the past year. And for international performances, we can go back two years. Again, this is provided that you were a member at the time. So if you've been a member of PRS for a number of years and you've not received royalties for recent performances, you can report those to us via our website. So this is what our website looks like. And we're now going to look at the process for raising a performance claim with PRS for Music. It's important to first ensure that all your works are registered with us. So we look at that first. To register a work with PRS, you must first log in using the button in the top right hand corner of the website, which is the green button circled on your screen. This will bring you to the welcome page. Here you can access a number of tools and apps available to PRS for Music members. Next to the welcome message, you will see buttons to analyze or download your statements, view your registered works, and also view your account details. If you're logging onto the PRS for Music website for the first time in a while, it would be worth informing us of any changes to your personal information, such as a change of address or bank details, because that will ensure that we can pay royalties to you. Below the welcome message, there's a section called your apps. Here you can register or amend works, report live performances, and also search our database for works. We'll first look at the process for registering works. After selecting register or amend the work, you will be greeted with this screen. Here you can follow the buttons to register a new work, amend the work, 
or through the history of registrations and changes that you've made. There are also handy links to frequently asked questions, such as how writers can authorize their shares of a work. But in this case, we're going to register a new work. So select that button to continue. This will bring up the register a new work form. You will first be asked to provide the title of your work, any alternative titles by which it's known, and the duration. Like I said, it's really important that you provide us with a duration. If you don't, it will automatically default to three minutes and one second. So entering the correct duration will therefore ensure that you receive the correct amount of royalties when the work or song is performed in a concert. So this is particularly important for people who write perhaps larger or longer form music, such as classical composers or people in, in jazz bands where there are long improvisatory sections. Below the title and duration is a section for specialized pieces of music. You'll be asked to, to select check boxes if the work was written specifically for an advert or ident used on TV, and if the work contains samples. There are also check boxes for dramatical musical works, such as the examples we discussed earlier. There are also boxes for classical music and film and TV music. So in this case, I've selected the classical checkbox, which prompts additional fields. And these are the description of the work and the instrumentation. So fill these in and then select next to progress through the form. This will bring you to the shares section of the form. Here you can enter the shares that you or your co-writers are entitled to. In order to do this, first select a role from the drop down menu. There are options including composer, arranger, and author. Next, you need to fill in the shares. If you're a self published composer, you would normally select 100% for both performing and mechanical shares. If you're a published composer or songwriter, your publisher would usually register the works on your behalf using the share split specified in your publishing agreement. If you're in a band or have worked with a co-writer or author, you can add these contributors using the add another writer button, which is one of the blue buttons on the screen here. This will enable you to search for a collaborator by name or membership number. Here, you can add them to the registration before selecting their role and entering the share split you agreed when writing the song or composition. It's important to note that while a single band member can register a work, other band members who contributed to the song will need to log into PRS for Music to approve their shares. When you've added the shares for each contributor, select Next. This will bring up the usages section of the registration form. This asks if you would like a PRS affiliate society to represent your work if it becomes active in the USA. You will be asked to nominate a US performing right organization, so an equivalent of PRS in the US, to collect royalties on your behalf. It's important to do this, particularly if your music is performed or broadcast regularly in the US. The reason why we ask this when it comes to the US and not other territories is that they have three different royalty collection societies. These are called ASCAP, BMI, and also CSAC. In this part of the form, you will need to select one of those in order for royalties to be collected in the US. In terms of which one to select, it's really up to the member. So feel free to research the distribution policies of each of the US performing right organizations. This section also asks if you have information related to a recording of the work, such as an ISRC number. It's not strictly necessary for a work to have been recorded in order to register it with PRS, though information such as the ISRC number 
will be useful when it comes to collecting royalties, particularly for online platforms such as YouTube. And this number is usually provided by your record label or distributor. So if you have that information, this is where you would enter it. But don't worry at all if your work hasn't been recorded yet. You can still register a work with PRS, no problem. Next, you'll be taken to a section titled Multiple Submissions. Here you can register other works using the same share picture you entered previously. And this is useful if you have a batch of works that you need to register that have the same share picture. Finally, you'll be shown a summary of the information you provided. Press send to register the work with us. Once you've submitted the registration, it'll take up to 24 hours for the works to appear on the live performance reporting tool, which is what we're going to look at next. So the report live performances tool can be accessed from the main homepage again via the Your Apps section. You'll see there's a blue button next to register and amend works, which is circled on your screen. Once you've selected report live performances, you'll be brought to this page. You can select the blue button to begin the process, or you can view your saved and submitted uh, set lists to check on the progress of your existing claims. Next, you'll be prompted to select the date of performance and the country in which the performance took place. For international events, you can type the country into the search box where UK is currently written. You will also be asked to specify where the event took place. So in this example, I have chosen the Barbican Centre just for the purposes of demonstration. You can search for the venue using the name and the postcode. This will provide you with a list of licensed premises from which to choose from. If you happen to perform at a venue which is not licensed, you can still provide us with information as there's a Google Maps plugin on this section of the website. And what this will do will create a licensing lead for our commercial partnerships team to investigate. You'll next be asked to provide details of the set list or program you performed. If you're touring, you might find it useful to create a set list named after the tour, which can be used in future claims. This example is just a one-off concept. So I've named it 9th of November, 2021 at the Barbican Center. Next, you must select the performer, which can be an artist or an ensemble. In the case of classical music, this might be someone like the London Symphony Orchestra. If you're in a band, it would be the name of your group. You must also specify whether you were a headliner or support act. When it comes to classical concerts or events where only one group played, then you should select headliner. So you're now ready to add which works were performed. These can be your own works or works which were not written by you. When providing a program or set list, it's important to list all of the works performed at the event. You can search for works according to the title, tune code, or ISWC number, if you know that information, but also the writer or publisher name. In this example, I have entered the name of the writer, which is just an example. Select add to the works uh, to add them to your set list. If you can't find a work because it doesn't appear, if it's your own piece, you will likely need to go back and register it. And if it's the work of somebody else, you can still notice, notify us of the title and name of the composer. So once you've selected all of the works in your program or set list, you can view and edit your set list. And this is what that looks like. The registered duration will be, will be selected by default here. Each song is three minutes and one second. You can adjust the duration to match the exact performance time. 
and this again is particularly useful for large scale perhaps classical works which might vary in duration from performance to performance it's also important to ensure the duration is correct because the information is used to calculate what portion of the royalties you are entitled to and when you've added all the works that are performed in the set list or program you can select submit on this screen to view the status of your set list or program select the submitted tab of the reported tool each claim is given a unique reference number which is useful when communicating with our member services team so if you have a question about a claim it would be worth providing us with that number when you speak to us we'll now look at how to troubleshoot issues when registering works or submitting set lists to prs we recently launched a new portal for our members to raise queries with us and they can also look at articles on frequently asked questions it also enables you to contact our member services team with any issues so back to the home page to access the query portal uh, you can click get help and support which is the button uh, circled on your screen this will bring you to the query portal here you can ask a question or navigate to your existing cases using the link at the top of the screen the query portal also includes articles on a range of topics including how to manage your works your account details and membership and understanding your royalties for now let's say for example that we have a question about wanting to find a list of my works registered with prs for music i want to see a full list of the works i've registered i can select see all from the managing your work section here this will bring up a range of articles relating to works common topics are readily available in the list below the search bar but you can also refine your search by entering a keyword the question that I was looking for, how do I find a list of my works, appears at the bottom of this screen. Selecting an option will bring up the article related to your chosen topic. This will sometimes contain an explainer video or a link to more information on our website. At the bottom of the screen, you can select whether this article actually solved your problem. Let's suppose that in this instance, I need further assistance. There's an option to raise a case with our member services team. And following this link will direct you to a form where you can provide more details about your question or issue. To view a record of your outstanding cases, you can select your cases from the query portal homepage. Each case will have a unique reference number which you can use when speaking with our member services team. Finally, I'd like to highlight the webinar section of our website, which is at prsformusic.com slash help slash webinars. Here you can find a selection of short explainer videos on frequently asked questions. It's a great place to go if you're using the website and you need a quick answer to a question. So I definitely recommend checking that out. And that's it for today's presentation. I hope that was helpful in explaining some of the tariffs for live performances and also how to register works and submit live performance claims. And what I'd like to do now is open up again for any questions. Thank you, Daniel, that was great. Um, so yes, if, if there's any further questions, we received a couple, um, a few actually um, during during your presentation but if there's anything else you can think of please put them in the q a box and we'll attempt to answer as many of them as possible so um let's start with the first one um what does prs do to manage risks such as businesses failing to apply for a prs license or concealing the use of songs on the basis that the individuals or companies may think that we won't say anything about it or nobody will know about it. Um, what can writers do if they have suspicion that the music is being used in this way? It's a good question. Thanks very much. 
what I would say, if you're someone who has had a performance and you suspect that that's not being reported to us, one of the things you can do is use that live um, set list tool, which we explained today. That is basically you telling us that you've had something performed. You can also get in touch directly with our member services team. Um, you can also search for licensed premises on our website. And if, if you've had music performed at a venue which is not licensed, then get in touch with our team really and, and tell us about the venue. That will create a licensing lead for our team and we'll get in touch with the venue and we'll ensure that a license is in place. Okay, super, thank you. Uh, I've just seen a message in the chat about the video becoming available later. Yes, it will be um, hopefully by the end of the day, but if not, definitely by um, tomorrow and it will be on our archive, which is ISM either ismtrust.org forward slash webinars or ism.org forward slash webinars. You'll, you'll see it there. You'll also have a notification from Zoom with the link there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, second one was, if I register work and play at a venue with my band, do I then receive royalties from the venue should the ticketing criteria be met, etc.? In other words, can I receive royalties if I play my music live or as PRS? for when my music is played by someone else, a cover slash venue? Yeah, uh, if you perform your own music in a band down a local venue, you will be entitled to royalties. And the same applies if someone covers your music. So what's important there is the fact that your music was played, who performs it, whether it's you or somebody else, doesn't affect whether or not you'd be entitled to royalties. You would in either case. Okay. Um, someone just asked, uh, they said they didn't quite catch the registering the work before it's recorded. Would you mind explaining that bit again, please? Yeah, so basically when you register a work with us, there's a section which asks, uh, would you like to provide us with an ISRC number? Basically, that's a code which is created when a work is recorded. And what it does is help us identify when your music is used, particularly with online platforms. So it's a helpful thing to have, but you don't need a work to have been recorded to register a work with PRS. Uh, that section of the presentation was just to say that piece of information is useful if you have it. But you can register works that haven't been recorded before. I work with a lot of classical composers where primarily things are written for live performance and won't be recorded sometimes. And PRS works the same whether things have been recorded or not. Okay, and the same person said, how does it work if I am a mashup artist? Um, may, I may ask for clarification on mashup artist. I assume you're kind of performing different, um, maybe medleys of different tracks or putting together different material. Uh, what I'd say in that instance is any material that you sample or borrow will need to be cleared with the rights holders if it's in copyright. Okay, thank you. Um, so back to the questions. When determining a share split in a band, does each band member have to pay the £100 for PRS or can they just log in for free and be identified as a contributor? Yeah, to receive royalties from PRS, you will need to be a member personally. So if you're in a band, each band and a member would need to be uh, their own member. You, there's, you can't have a kind of band membership to PRS. It needs to be you personally. And yeah, you can agree a share between yourselves. So if there's four of you, you might say 25% each. But to receive that 25%, you would need to be a member and pay that £100 yourself individually. Okay, thank you. There's another question in the chat. Uh, if you have many people that have written parts on a track, is there a one-off fee for recording or do they need to register with PRS themselves to get royalties for their part of the song, even though they are not the main songwriter? If you've made a contribution to a song as a recording artist, then it's worth having that conversation with whoever's managing the recording, whether it's a record label or not you might decide that your contribution is worth a share on the composition. In that instance, I would recommend uh, joining 
to be a member of PRS because you would receive royalties in that instance. Another aspect here is that if you're a recording artist working on song recordings, you may be entitled to PPL royalties for contributing to the recording. And again, whether or not you would receive shares depends on your agreement with the record label. So it's always really useful having that conversation with them about your PRS and about your PPL when you start working with someone. Perfect, thank you. Um, I think I spotted another question in the chat about educational performances. So for example, as part of a degree. Yeah, what I would say when it comes to educational performances is bear in mind that PRS comes into play whenever your music is communicated to the public. The same goes, for example, if you're working in a school, if it's something which is very much behind closed doors and it's something that you're working on as part of a project, then we wouldn't ordinarily um, expect that to be licensed and for royalties to be generated. If it's something where in a university you're putting on a concept and there's an admission fee, then you would be required to obtain a license in that scenario. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, when you register your work, where would you, where would pop slash dance music be classified? I think automatically when you register work with PRS, it's assumed to be a, a kind of general style like pop or dance. We have those check boxes for specialized elements and they only really exist where there are particular quirks which may occur. So for example, there's that dramatical musical work box that's there because the grand rights come into play and we don't license grand rights. Uh, so yeah, you can submit which genre you are with PRS for music, um, but yeah, there's no kind of categorization really. It's all treated as the same. Okay, perfect, thank you. I think our last question, if we don't receive anything more in the meantime, um, is when should you join MCRS? Do we mean MCPS? Maybe? I think that presumably is MCPS. Yeah. So MCPS comes into play whenever your music is mechanically reproduced as part of a CD, vinyl, or whether it's broadcast and also released digitally when streamed. So I'd say you should join MCPS when you're starting to release albums in physical format or when it's streamed and broadcast and when you think that the, the revenue that you'll generate will create more than 100 pounds in royalties per year. For specific examples, I would check out the previous webinar and I give some examples of you know how much airtime on BBC One would generate 100 pounds, how much airtime on BBC Radio 3 would generate 100 pounds. So that's an indicator of how much you would earn from those contexts. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Oh, we just had another question. Do I do I need to get a membership for PPL, PRS and MCPS separately or am I recording music or of am I recording music and intend to perform and release them? I'm, I'm guessing if I'm yeah. recording music and intend to perform and release them. Sorry. Yeah, so it sounds like you're basically doing everything. So you're recording the song, um, the song being performed and the songs being copied. In that instance, I would recommend joining all of those societies because you would be entitled to receive royalties, especially if you're a self-releasing artist, because that means that you were the owner of your sound recordings. If you worked with a record label, that might not be the case. But again, I'd kind of raise that point about the initial £100 fee. When you think you can earn that back within, I'd say, a year, that's when I'd say is the right time to join. But in, in theory, yeah, you would need to join all of those separately uh, to start collecting royalties. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have any further questions. Um, if anything occurs afterwards to, to any of the attendees, please, you can either email membership at ism.org. Um, I think the email address will be in the follow-up email you receive from, from Zoom as well. So um, you can get in touch with us and we can send your question to Daniel. Um, so I think um, it, 
all it's left is just to thank you, Daniel, again for both webinars. I'm, I'm sure they've both been really um, eye-opening for all of the attendees watching and really interesting. So we're very, very grateful. Um, just to say that, um, as I mentioned, the webinar will be available on the ISM Trust website, and that's ismtrust.org forward slash webinars, and you can um, see it hopefully from tomorrow. Um, also there, you can find a wide range of webinars available to view on demand, along with other resources that support the sector, many of which are available for free. So please um, uh, check that out. It's um, either on our website, the professional development section of our website. Um, so lastly, again, thank you very much. Just the, the other thing to mention is our next webinar um, will be in March at the moment. And it will be our teach meets. So if you either teach or have any friends that are musicians that uh, do any teaching and would like to socialize with um, other people in the teaching world and exchange ideas and opinions, um, you can find the link in the chat to register for that. So thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely rest of the afternoon and we hope to see you again at another webinar soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.